today on Tuesday. So what we're going to session 4A. So this session is going to be a little bit different because we have three separate 15 minute presentations that are going to be happening. So bear with us if we have any technical difficulties as we're switching between these slideshows and all that good stuff. Um, and hopefully at the end of all the presentations, hopefully we'll have some time left in QA. So if you want to hold your questions until all the presentations are finished, that would be great. Uh, as a reminder, all annual meeting attendees are expected to observe the SGA code of conduct, which you can find on page three of your program. And also, just so that you're aware, this session is being recorded. Um, so, introductions. As I said, we have three central presenters. First up, we have Lydia Brown and Gabrielle Hale and Catherine Sheriff. Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. Um, all from Mercer University. We're going to be speaking on broadening archival access with archive space. So they're going to go first, and then we have a second presentation from Leah Leftwitz over here, and then finally Tina C2 is going to bring up her rear. So, all right, I will hand it over to you all to get started. Awesome. I'll move over here. I yeah. Got it. Great. So, hi, everyone. So, we're from Mercy University's Archive Special Collections and Digital Initiatives. Um, and so for some background on who we are, Mercer was founded in 1833 by the Georgia Baptist Convention. Um, and so as a result, we collect items related to Mercer history, as well as Georgia Baptist history. Um, and then also there is a former women's college in Forsyth, Georgia called Tip College that we also collect materials for. And it closed around the 1980s. So with these materials, we have a variety of different patrons. We have the usual like faculty, staff, students, alumni, but we also have a lot of genealogists and as well as church historians who come and use our collections. So the Mercer Archive specifically has existed in some sort of form since the late 1930s, um, but for much of this history, it was run by very well-intentioned history lovers, um, but not people who were trained in archives. So as a result, we have a variety of different formats that we um, have been dealing with, um, and because these people also um, made a lot of indexes, which are very helpful, but they're not um, finding aids that we would we would like them to be. Um, so in addition to that, um, historically, we've had a very limited digital presence, um, but that has been a push over the last few years, both within the archives and the library in general, to make um, online resources available. So we've been focusing on URSA, which is our digital repository, as well as archive space, which we'll talk about today. So considering Mercer Library's goal of increasing digital services, we started to plan our move towards archive space to increase accessibility to our collection and finding aids. So we started taking steps around 2018, and our first priority was standardizing old finding aids. So to start, we decided to focus on our personal papers collections. Um, here we have a couple of examples of the range of formats we were dealing with, from Word docs with little to no consistency or structure, all the way to handwritten inventories. Um, as Gabby pointed out, Mercer Archives has long been run by non-archivists, which resulted in some unconventional descriptions and unique variety of formats. So you can see why standardization was one of our earliest priorities. So here's an example of a finding aid that we use today, the standardized version. Um, over the course of a couple of years, we tasked our student workers primarily with transferring existing information to the new finding aid format. Um, moving to the standardized finding aid was essential in establishing um, a workflow for importing large amounts of data into archive space all at one time. So it also allows us to easily identify and copy and paste appropriate fields to run our program and dump full container lists into archive space in only a few steps. So in 2020, we're ready to workshop the next phase of our plan, um, which is how we can import large amounts of information from our new finding needs into archive space. 
So the workflow that we ended up with involves a series of Excel spreadsheets and a Python program written to accommodate the format and language of our new finding aids. So to start, we copy and paste the full container list from the finding aid into the first Excel sheet. And then we're ready to run that information in Python. So the program takes the information from the first spreadsheet and formats it to be easily copied and pasted into the archive space batch and porch. So we're able to paste the entire container list into the appropriate rows and columns in the archive space batch upload sheet, whereas um, without Python, we'd have to copy this information in cell by cell. All right, so once we had a process for getting our collections into archive space, it was time to consider how our patrons would actually access our archive space collections. So um, that began our conversations with our electronic resources librarians to figure out how we could best meet uh, the needs of our patrons. Um, so we started by um, considering who our patrons were. We created some user personas for our most frequent users. And this helped us sort of identify the ends of the spectrum that we needed to address. So we had students and faculty who wanted to be able to search everything in the library catalog as well as everything in special collections and the archives and we had people from small towns in georgia doing church research who just wanted a one-stop shop to search only our archival holdings um, with that in mind we um, collaborated with erl to find a way to integrate our archive space content into alma without um, giving up our standalone archive space instance. So we now have a public facing archive space page that has a plugin that allows us to map all of the information from archive space into Alma. Um, of course, nothing is perfect. There were lots of issues with that plugin. Um, we had fields from especially subject and agent fields getting mapped into the wrong mark fields. We had our cataloger was unhappy with the way some of the information mapped over. So we really had to um, work together with ERL to find a solution that met both our needs and their needs in the process. Um, and for anyone interested, this is what our plugin looks like on Archive Space. You are able to search um, for the resource in Archive Space, and then it pulls up the um, the Alma ID and the archive space link, and then you can see what the mark record looks like. And just with one click, it pushes it over into Alma. Uh, once we started getting all of that information into archive space and into Alma, uh, we obviously needed to start troubleshooting and seeing where things were failing for ourselves and for our users. Um, and this resulted in us having to change some workflows up. Um, most notably, we had issues with subjects and agents. When we started the approach to archive space, we were very relaxed in our approach to subjects and agents, um, thinking that it was just our patrons who were going to be using this information. And so um, if we had a local set of subjects rather than using Library of Congress subject headings, it would be fine. Um, that was not fine, <laughs> unfortunately. And so we had to go back through and do a lot of work cleaning up those subject and agent files um, so that in Alma they could be represented properly. Uh, we also had to start considering some of our more frequently used vertical file collections, which do not have a finding aid. Um, they're just access databases. Uh, some of which have a lot of editorialized information about the files at hand, so we can't just move that information straight into archive space. So we've been doing a lot of problem solving, trying to figure out what the best case scenario is for representing those collections in archive space. That work is still ongoing. We also have some PDF documents that are really widely used by our researchers. Um, in some cases, they have the only information about church histories, church collections association records. Um, so we had to find a way to mine these PDFs for information 
um, and create artificial collections in archive space so that they were searchable along with our personal papers collections. And finally, um, we're dealing with our large AV collections and our unusual formats collections. That is a problem for another day, but it is definitely something we are considering. So while we're still doing troubleshooting, um, we are working towards going public with our collections. And that's the ultimate goal of this whole project, right? Is to create, um, provide accurate information about our collections for our patrons and for the public. So as Lydia mentioned, we're focusing on our personal papers collections. Um, and we currently have around 180 of these personal papers collections. Um, so we decided that our goal before we can go public is to have about 80% of those digitized, uh, I'm sorry, not digitized, described and put on archive space. So we have this Python program, right? That was batch importing information. So in order to make sure that that was all imported correctly and then exported correctly to Alma, we've been going collection by collection and making sure that all that information is accurate before it's pushed to the public interface. So um, Catherine, our digital archivist, she created a step-by-step -step guide for us non-digital archivists and also this handy dandy spreadsheet that um, we can go through the collection, look at, is there a location? Is the location accurate? Um, are there subjects and agents in archive space? So we've been doing that while also working with our cataloging librarian. Um, and as she um, works and creates new alma records, she puts it into the document and that way we're working at the same time with her. So our final steps for um, this process is to publish the resource and then push it to Alma. And overall, this tracking system has worked really well for us. Um, and we're at roughly 60% done with our goal. So we have 20% more to go, but um, it's been going really well so far. In addition to having archive space public, we also want to make sure that we're improving our web presence. So it's great to have archive space, but we have to make sure people can find it. Um, so we have been working with our electronic resources librarians to um, create a version of archive space that looks and feels like a Mercer website. So when our patrons get there, they feel like this is accurate. <laughs> this is a Mercer website. So it's now been changed to our signature orange and black. Um, we also have, um, so we have that information and they are working with us to make sure we have agency over what goes into archive space and how it's being explained to our patrons on like the landing page. We are also working with ERL um, to update our website on our general library page. And so that way we can highlight archive space, explain it along with our other online resources like LibGuides and URSA, our digital repository. So while we are still working on the Garden Public phase, um, we are looking ahead and what our future and ultimate goals are for archive space. So our timeline, um, it's obviously been years in the making, but our goal is to have archive space officially public in January of 2023. So that's, that'll be when we have that 80% goal completed. Um, and our plan is to do a rollout where it's on the social media, it's on our main library webpage, and we'll also contact some of our like more frequent patrons to tell them about this new service. Um, we are also looking forward to our next priority collection. So obviously personal papers have been our focus for a while now, but we also have the TIFF College collections, um, which are very heavily used, especially in our digital collections. So having these items described for those patrons are a real goal of ours. And lastly, we would like to continue digitizing items into URSA um, and then linking those to their counterpart in archive space. So overall, we believe that this archive space project is really uh, important and key to our goal of making these Georgia Baptist and Mercer items available for everyone to use. Thank you.
It's not on the share. I did. It says on screen sharing. And there's not um, I was gonna say, can you just close their presentation? Yeah. History Center, and I'm going to talk to you about a project I've been working on. I was trying to remember if it's been closer to three or four years, but it's been a minute. Um, so there's, I can, there's a lot to talk about, but I'm going to try to concentrate on what I think would be most useful in terms of what I learned from this project and what I think could be applied to other projects. Um, so it's going to be an overview of the digitization and cataloging of the John Burson Georgia Folklore Archives recordings. All right, let's, <laughs> there we go. Um, so the collection is um, actually from Georgia State. Uh, John Burson, Dr. Burson is a professor who's actually still there. Um, and he conducted oral history interviews. Um, his students conducted the interviews with training for um, mainly rural Southerners, uh, mostly in Appalachia, a good percentage from Georgia. And they date back to the, I think 66 is the first year. So this collection spans a long uh, time frame, And it also includes a lot of formats. Um, so there's audio, um, there is manuscripts, there are photos, there's a little bit of video too. Um, so I'd say one of the first hurdles I had to tackle was really figuring out what all this stuff was, how it was organized, um, because there was legacy processing that had been done on some of the collection and there were different, um, it was all done a little differently. So I had like several different things I had to decipher to get to understanding the whole collection. Um, with a big project like this, I feel like that's kind of, it's a good example of how really tracking your steps and documenting where things go is important so that somebody like me doesn't have to spend so much time deciphering. But ultimately, um, we discovered there's about 1,500 audiovisual recordings which is what I concentrated on for um, the last couple of years. But um, so it was kind of a two part getting at this project. Uh, we knew we had audiovisual that we wanted to digitize. And this was kind of a front liar in terms of a project because it was big and it had really great research value. Um, these are recordings of people who um, aren't traditionally recorded, you know, really rural um, folks for the most part. And um, they were generally elderly. So if they were done in 66 and these people were in their 80s, they document life in the early um, 19th and late, the, when I say that right, 19th century. And there's stories about the Civil War from these people's parents and grandparents. Um, and it's not just white Southern, uh, there's African-American interviews, there's Native American, there's at least one, I think more than one Jewish. Um, so it's, it's a really great collection that I've really enjoyed working with um, and has given me some cool opportunities. So uh, we applied for our first grant uh, with the Council on Library and Information Resource to uh, their recordings at risk. So we applied to digitize the whole collection. Um, again, we thought it had great research value. 
and it was on fragile media. Um, the year, mostly cassettes, the early ones were on reels. So all of that material has an expiration date. Um, they don't last forever. Paper sometimes can last forever, or at least a very long time, but um, audiovisual, not so much. Unfortunately, we did not get the grant. Um, and why didn't we get the grant? They flagged uh, copyright issues because the audio is still in copyright as pretty much all audiovisual is. Um, but there's too many copy holders for us to track down and get permission because again, there's 1500 recordings. Sometimes or usually there's multiple people being interviewed. Granted, sometimes they're interviewed in multiple audio. So there might be a few of the same people, but it's still hundreds probably over a thousand people. So realistically, we're like, we, we can't track all these people down. Um, but we still need to address what we can do responsibly. Um, and also digital preservation. So we have digital preserva preservation policies in place, but we didn't have an official like digital stewardship plan. So um, me and some coworkers did a little digging into these issues and uh, resubmitted. So we changed the grant so that we would only digitize a third of it, and that would give us more money for a cataloger. And a cataloger would be able to be a little bit more precise with if material had privacy issues or did not have a release form. Um, so we'd be able to kind of have a sliding scale of how open is this gonna be? Um, is only the metadata going to be available? Is the audio going to be available? Are we restricting it to the reading room? So that's kind of how we adjusted the grant. And we also strengthened our digital stewardship portion. Uh, still didn't get the grant. <laughs> um, worked a lot of hours on that, but um, had to move on. So this other grant came to our attention, the National Recording Preservation Foundation. Um, and this grant was a little different. It really emphasized preservation um, and had less in there about um, access. It's not that they didn't want access to happen. It's just that wasn't part of the actual structure of what they were asking. Um, so we tweaked, tweaked the grant a little bit and we asked to digitize the same amount of material. Uh, the money available with this grant was smaller. It was only up to 15,000. And I think clear was like 150,000. Um, and we dove in more uh, with that digital stewardship. Um, we talked with a grad student, I think she might have been at Valdosta, and really tried to make sure we were firm there. Um, and the literature that NRPF gave us about digital preservation was a little different. So we made sure to answer the questions that they were asking. Um, because it was just geared slightly different than clear. Uh, and we got some money with this one. Um, we didn't get the full amount. Unfortunately, we got about $5,000, but that was still great. That was still uh, material that we could get digitized. So um, we decided to move forward pretty similarly to what we were doing before, except we weren't going to be looking at the release forms as closely. What we do have is a note on every recording that says, if you think you are a copyright holder, contact us. And we do this on other oral history projects as well. It's just, I'd say a little more important with this one because it is a little unique in its history as an oral history project. Um, so yeah, that's what we did for this iteration of the project. Um, and then COVID hit. So, this actually ended up being a pretty good opportunity for me because I needed a remote project for me and for interns. And I was like, okay, I think this will work. It is digital. Um, I had I think like two, 200 plus recordings and I needed to figure out how to make this work. I had never managed a remote project before or for that matter, matter an oral history project before. So I learned a lot. <laughs> I really dug into like, how do I want this to work? What are my goals? And I mentioned that those pre-existing kind of remnants um, 
that ended up being helpful because there is a database, an incomplete database, but it does list a lot of the recordings and gives basic information about them. So I didn't have access right away to the physical collection, but I did have access to this database, which was able to help me and my interns catalog properly. And I had to ask my question, myself questions like, do we want to use ohms? Can we use ohms? Um, how often do I need to check in with my interns? How much do I need to teach them without overwhelming them? Um, and one thing I give myself some credit for is I was honest with my interns that first semester. And I told them, if something isn't working, let me know. This is an evolving project. Um, and I feel like I've gotten a pretty good handle on it, but it's been two plus years and it took me a minute to get to that place. But we still had quite a few recordings. Uh, we, at this point, had 1,259 that still needed to be digitized. So um, we decided to apply to the Digital Library of Georgia um, subgranting program, which is a great program. And they offer money for um, digitization, including audiovisual. This one was slightly different because part of the requirement was you had to create metadata within six months. Um, they also offer cataloging themselves, but we decided because of the nature of the project, I, it was better to continue with the structure I had in place. Um, but the metadata I've been doing is very detailed, so it takes a long time. So we had to think, okay, what can we actually catalog in six months? And that's how much money we asked for. Um, and we got the money, which was, again, great. Uh, we digitized another 150 items. Uh, we did not quite meet the six month mark, but I think we were within seven months. So pretty good there. Um, again, still 1,100 audiovisual materials, um, but we're about three fourths of, or one, one fourth of the way there. Um, so we applied once again, uh, this time to the Georgia Historical Advisory Council. And um, this and DLG as well actually have very accessible grants, uh, which made my life a lot easier because I already kind of had everything in place to apply because I'd already spent so much time on those first couple grants. Um, and I applied once again <laughs> for um, about $5,000 to digitize um, another set of recordings. And recently, uh, just within the last couple months, we did get those funds, which is great. So we're able to do another group of records and there is no uh, six month mark for this. I mean, I'm still gonna try to get these out at a good pace, but it varies semester to semester based on how many interns I get and if they're interns who fit well with the project. So it's always something I want to work on. It's just sometimes I have more ability than others. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about that metadata. Um, <laughs> this project has been complicated and it's been as much revising and going back and editing as it has been about creation. Um, so I've learned a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty proud of where it is now, but I know it's still gonna be evolving. Um, and one part of that, I'd say one of the most important parts is the need for reparative description. Um, as you might imagine, with a collection like this, there is a lot of outdated language, a lot of racist language. Um, so we put a disclaimer on all the records that say this is a historical record uh, we are not editing it, but it can be offensive. And this kind of became, I based it off a pre-existing note from our Veterans History Project and evolved it. And we have since then gone further and further uh, clarified it and made it stronger and are using it for more collections now. So it ended up being a good first step in thinking about what we needed this note to contain. Um, but there's also the description itself. And I've tried to be consistent, but when you're working with different interns, it can be hard. So I try to be as clear as possible. Um, a lot of the recordings have a timestamp where there's racist language, but I know it's not perfect, um, which kind of worries me a little bit. 
but I'm glad we have some kind of disclaimer. And also they vary a lot. Um, some of them might have a casual use of the N-word. Some of them are heavily, heavily racist and anti-Semitic and anti-immigrant, anti-Indigenous, or it could just be a reflection of the times. So they vary a lot within the fact that these are from the late six, 1960s and early 1970s. Um, and I've also learned a lot about subject headings kind of as that reparative description work, but also just subject headings. <laughs> these um, have a lot of great content that they're, as I keep saying, it's very great research value. So I really have been heavy handed with lots of subject terms um, because I feel like they will be helpful to researchers. Uh, but it has been a little outside of my comfort zone. So I've been lucky enough to work with some uh, coworkers who helped me there. And again, I know it's gonna be an evolving process. Uh, so where are we now? Um, we have digitized 391 recordings. We have 181 soon to be digitized. Um, there's actually 77 born digital files uh, because this project went up to almost present day. So, you know, the stuff from the last 10, 15 years is on DVD and CD. So that means um, there's 361 records published uh, that are in Dublin Corp. And we have 108 left to write. Um, but <laughs> the big but is there's still 923 items that need to be digitized. If anyone has any thoughts, please let me know. Um, in a way, it's not a lot of money, but it's like just out of grasp. Um, so that's high on my priority list. But what did I learn? Um, I learned the importance of flexibility and resourcefulness. Uh, lots of changes here, as you can see, lots of rethinking the process. I uh, learned an appreciation for small victories and incremental progress. I would love to get all of this done, but I'm still glad that we've gotten as much done as we have. Um, and it's a great step in terms of digitizing some of the oldest records. So those at least are safe. Uh, more just uh, on the ground, I learned more about copyright, privacy, digital stewardship, and subject headings, maybe more than I ever thought I would. <laughs> and um, I really started to understand a little bit more deeply the need for reparative description, which is something I'm focusing on more broadly now at the History Center, as well as some of my coworkers, and kind of trying to wrap our head around what that'll look like holistically, um, which is gonna be an interesting journey, I'm sure. So yeah, I feel like this is a great example of kind of how complex a project can be, but also how much you can learn from um, moving forward with it. So yeah, there we go. <laughs> Well, we have to start the share. Just oh, one more second. Okay. I think if you want to flip through, then thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for staying. <laughs> Um, I'm Tina C2. I'm at the Delta Flight Museum and the archives, but I'm also, for most of my career, been very involved in disaster response and preparedness. And now I want you to be as well. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I wanted to start. I actually read through my description this morning to make sure I was still on target. I don't think I did a pretty good job. Um, 
through the years, we've just, we've learned so much uh, after disasters and dealing with them that there are just kind of these three key um, uh, uh, so, brain, but there are these three uh, key factors to a successful response to recovery. And preparedness is the one that we know about. We need to have a plan. We need, uh, you know, we can go on and on about what needs to be in that plan. Um, communication um, is part of that. Communicating not only within your institution, but outside and with others. So networking. And related to that, of course, is relationships. Relationships with people around you that can help you and relationships with first responders. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Wanted just a little bit of history for those of you. Try, try not to put you too much to sleep, but um, has anyone here heard of Alliance for Response? Okay, got one. Um, this was launched by Heritage Preservation in 2003, really came into being into its own after Hurricane Katrina when there was this realization that uh, there was a really bad disaster and not a, a real way to get um, information from people's brains that had the information on how to do recovery and how to, and getting that in, in onto the ground. But um, they started out by just encouraging uh, planning and um, creating networks. Uh, they started slowly. Um, they really focused on maybe larger metropolitan areas. Um, get, it was also a way of meeting your first responders so that you're not meeting them the day you have the disaster. That's not the day. You want to know them ahead of time and getting your community to understand how important your cultural heritage is. And to see a great example of this is, well, we're gonna, I uh, don't wanna ruin this surprise, hold on. Um, and again, those um, trying to influence official emergency policies and plans. So um, they, part of this initiative, we did a, a kickoff meeting in Georgia for Alliance for Response. Um, so, okay, on my slide, there's some animation on yours, not so much. Let's see what that, okay, there we go. So, um, the Her uh, HERA, Her Heritage Emergency Response Alliance, it, it, we are, were originally encouraged to just keep it to the Atlanta area. Um, we kind of broke the rules a little bit in the beginning. And then we realized very quickly that disasters don't just happen in Atlanta. It's weird. Um, and we were more prepared to be a resource for the people outside of Atlanta. So people on the coast, um, tornado alley, that sort of thing. So we have since then um, just forget about just being metro area Atlanta, which is now, of course, 20 counties, you know, um, but to really just serve as a resource throughout the state. And then in 2010, the Savannah Emergency, um, Heritage Emergency Response was, for, uh, they did an AFR and that's where I was gonna lead you to showing their, they used the opportunity to show the local officials how important their institutions are to tourism and leaking, leaking the importance of their institutions. Like, you know, you take away these museums and then who, that, you know, I guess people will still go down there, but the rich, the rich experience that they get will, will no longer be there, um, which was a great, great thing. Um, so, and we've been, we have mutual aid agreement. Uh, I, okay. um, right now, yeah, I think we have 114 members. It, it fluctuates, people retire, um, people come in. 
we have a steering committee, directory of members, not, uh, not nothing really external. It's really a more internal document, but we try to um, just, it's more of a contact document um, so that we know where everyone is. This, it's been around for a while. Share kind of similar things. Um, they really linked into the Ch Chatham County Emergency Management Agency, which is great. Um, they've been helpful. They even have in their emergency management web ESC uh, a link that has all of their institutions map and it's it's wonderful. So yeah, they um, you know, when your children grow up and and are better than you. That's that's a good thing. <laughs> so if you were in one of the virtual talks today, I would encourage you maybe to go back and listen to it um, when you get home. But it, uh, they talked about the link data project. I'm not going to hear. It's very, very nerdy and get nerdy, of course. And I don't know how to talk about it in that way. But um, this was, we need it. You know, if we're going to help people throughout the state, we have to know who you are and how to get to you and, where, you know, and that sort of thing. So we found out about a Lyricist Catalyst grant, and I did talk to Jim Belisky, the Belisky, they still have these. These are all institutions that helped us. Some of you are on this list. And um, the goal was to um, kind of map out where all these important institutions are, keep it very broad. So in 2018, when the project started uh, using data that they had, we had 40 institutions mapped. You can see them there. These were institutions that already had a Wikidata page based on their location. Um, the grant helped pay to map the rest. Well, not we don't claim to have everyone in there. Um, but as of March 2022, sorry, I don't have the updated for now, but you've got 2,150 resources. So um, one of the things, uh, just to show you the usage since that we finished the project, we've had several hurricanes. Um, Big storms. We've had flooding in several areas of the state. Of course, Hurricane Ian. Has anyone gotten an email from us? No, let's see why. Um, we now, instead of just sending out a blanket email to 2,000 institutions, we can now use the data uh, in, in the GAMPS database to find out who's in each GEMA region. Um, so, of course, that usage, I don't know, that's from Cliff's talk. Young yeah, asking about that slide. But um, if we base it on some documents that we've been able to put together working with GEMA and um, the Department of Ag. Uh, yeah, that's a whole other story about why, is, why are we partnered up with the Department of Agriculture, but it's the ESF 11 which is natural resources and agriculture. All that is to say, came up with some charts to help, you know, tell us what to do, when to do it, when to start. This is more about hurricanes, of course. We have, we have checklists that tell us, and where we come into play is identify the regions that may be affected. We can now go in the database, pull up, information, send out email, uh, pre-storm or after storm. And uh, you can't read that, but that's a that's an email we send out. Got some great information. And you might be asking, well, how do I get that email? Well, so, uh, well, let me go through this one. Yeah, some of the things that we've identified, here's how we can help. We can contact our mutual aid partners, we can do pre-storm warnings, that sort of thing. We monitor condition and then of course following up afterwards. Uh, how, can, how can you be on this list? One great thing is to go into that GAMPS database and see if you're in it. We can't get in touch with you if you're not in that database. 
Then if there are great um, instructions on the website to go in and change your information to put you on that. One of the problems we found, so to get all this information, we had a, a, a grant employee that went around and collected stuff off the internet, which takes a long time. We didn't have, but we didn't have time to call every institution. So what we recommend is that you have some sort of uh, generic email or generic number put in here so that we can get in touch with you pre and mostly afterwards. Um, don't put somebody's personal email in because then what happens? Well, I, we get all these bounce backs. So-and-so left the job, check, you know, um, which has happened. So that's what you can do if this is something you want, you know, you want to call from us. Um, so then um, another group that formed after Hurricane Katrina is the National Heritage Responders. And this is a group of conservators, uh, museum employees, archivists, librarians that go and get trained to actually respond. Now they're not going to do the whole recovery piece, but they they can come, particularly with the major storms when there's a national disaster declared. They can come on site and kind of help. They also have an emergency helpline. So the other thing you can do is write down that number and put that in your disaster plan, because you all have a disaster plan, right? See somebody, maybe? Okay. One-stop shopping there for getting advice. Um, if you, you have an individual, there's an email, and then of course I have a non-urgent non email. But uh, right now, I think there's still over 100 volunteers. And again, they, they're trying to keep all, you know, somebody who's, knows buildings, decorative arts, also library and archives. I, I'm a national heritage responder from the library world. And when you call that number, if, depending on what month it is, I might actually answer the phone. And this, this is all volunteers, um, but there's been made, uh, the eight major deployments, um, but small disasters, no problem. Just call the number and somebody can probably assist you over the phone. So this went around for a while, you know, they started in 2007, they did another round in, in 2011, and then all of a sudden, wow, we had this kind of mass um, retirement of professionals going on. So they ramped up training again, and this time they were like, well, let's, let's start training people in target areas. And so we were asked to be part of the first grant to go with the state. Um, and do a state training. And we, uh, we started in 2019, we had over 40 applicants. Uh, we tried to get people from all regions around the state and tried to get as many specialties as we could. And then in March, 2020, we didn't do anything, even though that had been in the plans. So a part of it was a lot of uh, online training and then we were supposed to meet in person. Uh, so two years later, we had some people drop out and that's okay, but we met in person finally in Savannah and did our training and I was hoping to come in and like, this is what we're doing, uh, but we're not quite there yet. We are trying to figure out uh, what our next steps are. We have three now groups in Georgia. We have two networks. We have this group of trained professionals. We're trying to figure out how to sustain these groups. And we, I don't need to tell you how hard right now it is to get people to step up when they're already working 40 hours and then like, you gotta do this too on your, your own time. So we are going forward with people from all three of the groups and we will come out on the other side, maybe net talk for next time with um, how these three groups will work together. Is there one umbrella? Uh, we're welcome any information that you might want to contribute, um, but the idea is that we will still have all of the um, things that we've been doing, um, focusing on education, but also outreach and, and, you know, 
but but having that Georgia Heritage responder so that when you do like we still we still want you to call the hotline, but when you do call the hotline, they will have us to go and to help you, and it's going to be easier because we are here instead of having you know someone from DC that needs to get a flight to come down and so so stay tuned and. Um, I will say, if you want to be in either one of these groups, if you're in the coastal area, the share is part of the Coastal Museums Association and uh, or the hair group, please go um, and Google us and join. It's uh, individuals. You don't have to be a, a, a institutional membership and you, we put you on our listserv and you get information from us occasionally we don't spam so, and if you have any questions i'm help, happy to answer thank you all right so we do have a few minutes for questions maybe what i'll do is leave one mic up here with you all if you want to answer the questions into the mic and then i'll run a mic back to whoever has a question To the Atlanta Heritage Center. Um, do y'all digitize in house? Y'all keep obsolete the equipment and digitize. Do y'all have the ability to digitize in house? Uh, do you mean the History Center? The History Center. That's what I mean. Um, is this working? Uh, no, uh, we work with Preserve South. To digitize the audiovisual material. We do a little bit of uh, photography work in house, um, but not for bigger projects like this. Um, this is more of a comment, and this is for anybody who has folklife or folklore collections. The National Endowment for the Arts is very interested in building uh, more about um, both arts and folklife. Um, so, uh, you may want to contact the Georgia Council for the Arts. Other questions? Hi, this is for for Leah. Um, how did you standardize which interviews were going to be digitized first? There's a lot. Yeah. Uh, we went with the oldest. Um, I guess a little bit of inside knowledge is some of the oldest are actually already digitized with some of that in-house material, but they weren't done that well because they didn't have the expertise of someone like Preserve South. Um, so we decided at a certain point sometimes, and I wonder if this was the best choice with our resources to re-digitize those old ones so they'd be a more accurate representation. Uh, yeah, we just went with the oldest first because those have the closest to an expiration date. The good news is there's only been a few of them that couldn't be digitized. Um, and I actually think because we did have those earlier records, even though they're imperfect, I think we were able to fill in the gap, which is great. So hopefully going forward, as they become more and more modern, that's less of a risk, although there's still a timeline on this. Uh, this is for Tina. Um, I, I don't know if this is a silly question, but I wonder if for like when, you know, there is a disaster, do you guys, I don't know, collect on the disaster? Do you know what I mean? Like if a disaster happens and, you know, you do this, this, and this, and do you like make an effort? I don't know if there's time when you're trying to like solve a disaster, but do you collect on you know, the community around that, the things that happened around the disaster? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the focus of the heritage responders is really more um, uh, institutions. And um, there are definitely uh, groups that do that and tends to be the, the local entities like public libraries will try to collect information about disasters that happen around them. 
but this is more of a national organization and really what it really is about heritage collections that that helps. All right, well, thank you so much to our presenters.